A congressional committee considers additional aid to El Salvador. Steel workers bite the bullet in wages to save their jobs. And another bomb scare in Las Vegas, times three. Those stories and more next on the Channel 12 Update News. Roberta Babb tells why she believes in feral mobile homes. This is our third mobile home we have purchased from Ferrell's. We shopped near and far and could find nothing to compete with Ferrell's mobile homes. It's awfully hard to find a place that my whole family is contented with, and we're all very happy with this one. And most of all, what I really like, when something goes wrong, I can call Ferrell's, and they're usually out the same day, if not the very next day. You can believe if we ever have to buy another mobile home, it will be from Ferrell's. Food Horizons, the fine food store that saves you more. At Food Horizons, our goal is to be the very best. Isn't that what you want for your family? Food Horizons, Town Plaza, Cape Girardeau. This is Channel 12, KFES-TV. This is KFES 12 News Update with news anchors Mike Shane and Dave Corvassier, meteorologist Don McNeely, and sports director Randy Ray. Good evening. President Reagan left Washington for a trip to California today. And what he left behind was a new round of debate over the United States aid to El Salvador. A senior administration official says Mr. Reagan is thinking of increasing the number of U.S. military advisors in El Salvador beyond the current limit of 55. The official traveling with the president to California aboard Air Force One also said the role of the advisors might be expanded in combating leftist rebels. The disclosure came just hours after the administration stepped up a move for more military military aid to El Salvador. The White House wants Congress to approve $60 million worth of arms aid for the Salvadoran government. The president called key senators to the White House today as Secretary of State Schultz pushed for the aid package on Capitol Hill. The message was, stop the communists in El Salvador or get ready to face them on the Mexican border. Assistance program in our national interest is aid to El Salvador in our national interest, sir? Yes, sir, it is, without any doubt. It's in our national interest because it is connected right up on through to Mexico on, with whom we have a long border. So the emergence of another country added to Cuba, Grenada, Nicaragua, uh, another country, and then perhaps others, to uh, Soviet Cuban influence is bad news for this country, for our security interests. Clearly, the, the, the stability of Central America is the most vital aspect of our national policy, short of only one other, and that is our national survival itself. And I personally feel that we need to move on the emergency problem but we need to come up with a more effective plan addressing the entire region, which is very serious. Anyone who thinks it's just this country or that country is wrong, in my view. The number one problem is Mexico on our border. El Salvador is not just El Salvador. It's entire United States security in the Western Hemisphere, and particularly its impact on Mexico. Reports from Washington indicate the White House and some congressional leaders would welcome a review of all U.S. policy in Central America. Mine workers at the Ozark Lead Company mine near Ellington, Missouri, will vote tomorrow on a proposal that would cut their pay about $2 an hour. A company that warns that without those pay cuts, the workers would lose their jobs. The vote involves members of Steelworkers Local Number 944. Ozark Lead employs some 250 workers around Ellington. And in Pittsburgh today, the United Steelworkers Union reached tentative agreement with seven top steel makers on a concessionary contract. The pact aims to prevent the ailing industry from losing more business to low-cost foreign companies. Competitors. Terms of the agreement were not made public, but union sources said they included pay cuts of about $1.20 an hour and the loss of some holiday and vacation time. Meanwhile, at the bankrupt B.C. manufacturing plant in Malden, some employees are still working without pay. But Joel Larkins reports, not without hope. 
Less than a week after it went under, a handful of employees were back at work without pay at BC to restart production. Combined, their efforts turn out only a fraction of the plant's capabilities. But even the limited production by this company has raised some eyebrows and some questions. One, is this a move to indeed save the company's customer base or a move to clean up the company's books? With the amount of activity we've got going on here and the materials that we're dwindling down to now, it would be impossible to clean anything up. It's just trying, an effort to try to do something for the people we do have out there. The small group of volunteer workers say they believe the plant will reopen. And while no promises have been made, it stands to reason their chances of getting rehired should the facility reopen could be a little stronger. But exactly what will happen to the plant could be decided on Wednesday. That's when a federal judge will hear the bankruptcy case involving B.C. And from that decision, the employees could find out if their gamble on the company pays off. Joe Larkins, KFES 12 News, Malden. Stock prices fell today on Wall Street. Dow Jones Industrials dropped more than eight points as many traders cashed in on the profits from last week's gains. Gold fell $42.50 an ounce on the COMEX. But analysts say that could be a good sign for the future of the U.S. economy. David Jackson has a report. From Hong Kong to London and on to New York, when the metals markets opened this morning, it was obvious it was going to be a busy day for gold traders. From the start, gold was selling for $50 less an ounce than the closing price Friday. One analyst called the trading nervous. Gold averaged about $500 an ounce for most of February, but it was down as low as $395 at one point today. It finally closed in New York at just over $400 an ounce. The gold price plummet reflects worldwide concern that oil producers will fail to agree on price and production levels and that an all-out oil price war will begin. One fear is that oil prices will drop way down and that producers may have to begin selling off gold reserves in order to make do. So that yellow metal, long seen as so safe in troubled times, has now lost a lot of its glitter. David Jackson, CBS News, New York. Half of the marriages in America end in divorce. Tonight, Sharon Denny has a report on efforts of the Roman Catholic Church to do something about that very disturbing statistic. When a couple decides to take a walk down this aisle, they vow to love each other till death do us part. But how can they know the problems and challenges that they'll face in the years to come? The people in this room are getting a better understanding of those problems as they choose to take marriage preparation courses before they take the walk down the aisle. Eight years ago, the diocese decided that too many marriages were not properly prepared for when they entered into, and uh, we adopted this program of trying to help the young couples uh, be as prepared. We feel that in most any field that you enter into, it takes a considerable education. 75% of the Catholic dioceses in the U.S. require couples to take training before they marry in the church. The five-session program covers communications, finances, sexuality, religion and marriage, and practical problems in the home. This class in the home of Gail and Frank Jones is session number four. They've helped us with the finances and showed how we can you know, do the finances together instead of just one person doing them. There's an old saying that uh, people can live on love. Do you think that's true? <laughs> Not today, no. I don't. I think it, you could, you know, make it really far, but I don't think in the long run it would work out. It would just be too much pressure. Nationwide, church statistics show 8% of couples taking the classes decide not to take the marriage step. Sharon Denny for KFES 12 News. Coming up, Martha Mintz joins some Vietnam War veterans at a counseling session. That's ahead on 12. This is the place for the real taste of beer. Uh, Paps for Molly. Paps is the place. There's just no doubt about it. Hey, I tried a lot of beers, but uh, I always come back to Paps. Paps is the place. Leave your friends all around you for the real taste of beer. And all the good times you have here. It's what beer ought to be. I mean, you really know you're drinking beer. For the real taste of beer, Paps is the place. Hey, let's have another one, okay? Peak performance in the field begins with proper nutrition at home. That's why I use Magnum dog food. Magnum is a premium quality dog food at a very affordable price. That's what makes it a Magnum value. Whether you have an active working dog or just a family pet, Magnum guarantees your dog complete nutrition. 
That's Magnum Performance, day in and day out. Look for all three Magnum dog and puppy foods at your favorite store. Wouldn't you like to own a new home? I'm Gary Gilmore with Gilmore Homes in Sykes, Missouri. And this is my daughter, Blythe. We're featuring a 14 by 52 bedroom for 9,800, a 14 by 73 bedroom for 12,900, and the very latest 14 by 83 bedroom, two bath, 15,900. Oh, come on, Dad. You can do it better on the 80 foot. Okay. 14 by 80, 14,900. Remember, we give you 200 miles free delivery and years free service. Let us help you buy your new home today. Come to Gilmore Homes. Presenting Equal, the revolutionary low-calorie sweetener people are talking about. A story in the Chicago Sun-Times reports, a taste virtually indistinguishable from sugar. It's really luscious. Fortune magazine reports, Equal is almost too good to be true. It has no saccharin, no bitter aftertaste, just one sweet taste after another. Welcome to the sweet life of Equal. Well, have you ever been in a traumatic situation, handled it well, and then started to shake or even worse, have nightmares? Well, war veterans certainly have many of them. The medical term for that is delayed stress syndrome. And that's tonight's health and medical topic with Martha Mensch. Every time this is a group of Vietnam vets. They meet once a week at St. Francis Mental Health Center in Cape Girardeau for what they call their rap sessions. They talk with psychologist Larry Holdman, also a Vietnam vet, about their after effects of a war involvement that ended 10 years ago. The after effects have been termed the delayed stress syndrome. It was a condition that was diagnosed following World War II in which uh, individuals who had been involved in combat uh, returned home and found that they had difficulty handling certain situations that might arise that would remind them of a particular incident that they had faced under uh, combat or the stress level would reach the same as it was at that particular time and then their, their reaction to that stress. Weldon Rubel was with the Marines in Vietnam. He retired some time ago and now he's going to college. That was, he wanted to smile at it, but around my wife and sons I was short-tempered. Different person? Yes, I was completely. In fact, people at home told me that I seemed to be a different person. I was longer easy going and smiling. I'd walk down Broadway and it'd see me and I'd have a nasty look on my face, my hands be clenched, and I didn't realize I thought I was the same person. <laughs> Bill Ralston was with the 1st Marine Unit to land in Vietnam. Several years after the war, he started having flashbacks. You know, I can be driving down the road and all of a sudden just come up on a familiar type terrain or something, you know, and it just, the flashbacks of uh, Vietnam come to me. The rap sessions have been going on now for about three months. The men say that they've helped them a great deal because they have someone to talk over similar problems with. The delayed stress syndrome can happen to almost anyone. Holdman says the important thing to do about it is to find somebody to talk to. The condition is treatable with a success rate being very good. Martha Minch, KFES 12 News. We hope to have a medical update on the condition of Terry Kimes a little later in the news. Terry's been in surgery since 1 o'clock this afternoon at the University of Medi uh, Minnesota Medical Center. And at last report, he was still in surgery. Okay, we'll have that later. The news about the Challenger space shuttle is not so good tonight. A leak has been found in another of the shuttle's engines. That's three sets of engines and three different sets of leaks. The engines will have to be repaired, so that means yet another delay in the first flight of the Challenger. Well, let's see what Don McNeely has in store for uh, Tuesday's weather. Don's forecast for the first day of March is ahead on 12. Hi, I'm David Keel. I'm here to invite you to visit Keel AMC Jeep. See me personally for your Jeep and car sales. Keel AMC Jeep has a large stock of CJ Jeeps, four-wheel drive pickups, Wagoneers, Cherokees, Jeep Scramblers, and the Motor Trend Car of the Year, Alliance. Made in Kenosha, Wisconsin, the amazing Alliance gets 50 miles per gallon on the highway. See Keel AMC Jeep in Cape Girardeau for the vehicle of your choice. At Cape Mercantile, we're with you. Partners in commerce and industry, and part of that new on-the-grow feeling in Cape Girardeau. At Cape Mercantile, you're important to us, and you can rely on our ability to handle all of your banking needs because we take care of business. Be sure and come by and see us here at Cape Mercantile with our all-new look. Here's where your future counts. 
Cape Mercantile Bank and Trust, member FDIC. Cheatham's in downtown Saxton is having an inventory reduction sale. It's a big store and the savings are even bigger. Save $600 on the six-piece suit. Was $11.99. Cheatham's price $5.99. Save $540 on this all-wood bedroom. Was $9.39. Cheatham's price $3.99. Savings are unbelievable on the sofa love seat and chair. Cheatham's price $3.99. And this 25-inch Zenith color TV, only $5.49. Now you know why people from five states buy at Cheatham's in downtown Saxton. The furniture corner of Saxton. Southeast Missouri. Meteorologist Don McNeely's weathercast is approved by the American Meteorological Society nationwide. Well, it's bye-bye to a dry, mild February, and March is going to come roaring in like a lion tonight, but fortunately not for our part of the map. A big storm out in the west, another down in the southeast, but in between, a rather placid way to greet the new month. We've got a low-pressure trough just west of us, but it isn't causing anything in the way of weather for us. There's a big low down over southwest Georgia. It has brought heavy rains in the last two days to Florida and on up into the Carolinas. Tonight, there are all kinds of watches and warnings for gale winds of 60 miles an hour, high tides, beach erosion, gale winds as we said, and very heavy rains all along the South Atlantic coast. The east had the lowest in the country this morning, 18 at Elkins, West Virginia, but by mid-afternoon nine cities in Michigan had record highs for the date, including uh, Jackson, Michigan with a 57 degree reading. We had temperatures in the 50s here, Tulsa hit 63, Brownsville 72, a few showers along this stationary front changing to light snow along the northern border, but the big storm tonight is moving into the west coast. Uh, Another of a series of bad winter storms, and the Weather Service says this may be the worst of the bunch. Already warnings out for avalanches and heavy snow in the Sierras, high, heavy rains of up to five inches expected along the coast. Needless to say, a flash flooding, beach erosion, and uh, mudslides are expected as this new storm slams in to mark the advent of March. In our region, local radar is showing nothing but a clean sweep. The national radar shows the new rain and snow sweeping into the west. A little bit of rain in the upper Midwest and the bulk of it down in the southeast where in the last two days several spots in Florida have had over five inches of rain. Currently we're at 45 degrees after topping out the day at 57. Our humidity is at 79 percent. The winds are now calm and the barometric pressure rising from 29 and 97 hundredths inches. A few scattered clouds at 25,000. Visibility 10 miles. We've had no precipitation to wind up the month with well less than an inch. Regional temperatures at this hour. 44 is at Farmington and Harrisburg, Paducah and Carbondale at 45, Ridgely and Poplar Bluff at 43 degrees. We'll be back to look ahead to the new month of March in a moment. When you spray Bladex in a tank mix with a grass herbicide, you stop tough weeds and corn two ways without carryover. Bladex attacks grasses and broadleaves through their roots, while your grass herbicide works mainly through shoots. This root and shoot action means consistent control over various weather, soil, and weed conditions. Get high performance weed control. Use Bladex plus your grass herbicide for freedom from grasses, broadleaves, and carryover. Ask your dealer for Bladex. Need a lawn or garden tractor? We've got Cub Cadet tractors. A choice of horsepower, gear drive, or hydrostatic. Need tractor attachments to mow, doze, throw snow, or tow. For great tractor values, service, maintenance, it's Cub Cadet. Free more deck with purchase of Cub Cadet tractor at Mid-America Power, your lawn, garden, parts, and service dealer in Cape for over 30 years. Here's the way the map should look by tomorrow evening. That low in the east should move off, taking the rain with it after a rainy day in the southeast. A lot of snow in the upper Great Lakes, at least scattered snow showers. A warming trend moving from the southwest into the midwest, while the far west will again be hit by a series of really severe heavy rainstorms moving in from the Pacific. Temperatures tomorrow will be rather mild. We'll be well up in the 60s here. Southwest Texas, the warmest area in the 80s. Northern Minnesota will get only into the 20s. 
And if you uh, look at your utility bill, you may not believe this chart, but the energy consumption this winter because of our mild winter has been running well below normal. In Illinois, 8% below normal. Missouri, Kentucky, and Tennessee consuming 6% less energy than normal. Arkansas, 3% below. So uh, think what your utility bill would have been if the winter had been a normally cold one. For southern Illinois, partly cloudy, cool weather tonight with a low in the 30s. Then tomorrow will be variably cloudy with a high in the upper 50s, maybe even 60. Partly cloudy and cool tomorrow night with a low of 38 to 40. West Kentucky, mostly cloudy and cool tonight, low in the upper 30s. Tomorrow, we can look for partly sunny skies, high up around 60, and tomorrow night, fair and warmer, with a low of 42 to 45. For northwest Tennessee, decreasing cloudiness tonight, low of 37 to 39, then sunny and warmer tomorrow, high in the low 60s, and fair and a little warmer tomorrow night, with a low in the mid-40s. For southeast Missouri, fair in the north tonight, still cloudy in the boot heel, with lows of 34 to 38, mostly sunny sunny and warmer tomorrow, high of 62 to 66, and clear and a little warmer tomorrow night with a low of 39 to 42. Light variable winds tonight and light southerly winds tomorrow. And the extended outlook for the first four days of the month of March looks very good again. Partly cloudy tomorrow, fair on Wednesday, high up around 68, then uh, highs in the low 70s both Thursday and Friday with lows in the 40s, and if we get that high it'll be running 15 to 20 degrees above normal for this time of year. We've just completed a very, very dry February. We had only about seven tenths of an inch of precip, and normally we get three inches. But in the 70s, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Gosh. Actually, though, the record high for today is 84. When was that? Second. 1976, I believe. Hasn't been that long ago. <laughs> Thank you, Don. Well, police found dynamite bombs today at three of Las Vegas' largest resort hotels. All of the explosives were removed and safely destroyed. Dave Davis has details. The three bombs, described as sophisticated timing devices, were found in the parking lots of the Stardust, Desert Inn, and Frontier Hotels. In each case, the device was right next to the casino buildings. The series of events began shortly after midnight when police received a call warning that a bomb was planted in front of the Stardust. Las Vegas Fire Department bomb squad personnel took the device to a desert area and detonated it. But several hours later, it would be the same story, this time just after dawn. Police cordoned off the strip and the bomb squad returned. Security guards at the DI and Frontier had found similar devices after searching their hotel properties in the wake of the Stardust incident. Hundreds of guests evacuated the hotels as a precautionary measure. The bombs were made of 10 sticks of dynamite and were concealed in cardboard boxes. A spokesman for the bomb squad said each device had been triggered to fire, but all of them apparently malfunctioned. He said whoever built the bombs intended for them to explode. Several false bomb threats were called into various strip resorts following the early morning incidents, but police found no other devices. Officers say they had only the one contact with the suspect during the first warning phone call, and he never made any demand for extortion money. At this point, they say, there is no indication whether the man plans to strike again. David Davis for CBS News, Las Vegas. Prices fell sharply on the Chicago Board of Trade today. The pressure came from falling prices of special metals, and wheat was under additional pressure from the U.S. trade disagreement with China. China is a major customer for American wheat. At the close, wheat was 14 and a half to 17 and a half lower. Corn was off four and three quarters to six and three quarters, and soybeans off 12 and three quarters to 14 and three quarters. A lot of people surprised about a basketball game in Sykeston tonight. As a matter of fact, the Kelly Hawks, a uh, good ball club all season long. Well, their season ended tonight by an even better team. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Okay, Randy has all the state tournament playoff scores. And after sports, well, an update on Terry Kimes. That's ahead on 12. Roberta Babb tells why she believes in Farrell Mobile Homes. This is our third mobile home we have purchased from Farrell's. We shopped near and far and could find nothing to compete with Farrell's Mobile Homes. It's awfully hard to find a place that my whole family is contented with, and we're all very happy with this one. And most of all, what I really like, when something goes wrong, I can call Farrell's, and they're usually out the same day, if not the very next day. You can believe if we ever have to buy another mobile home, it will be from Farrell's. Now, 
all to recognize an individual whose outstanding sales record comes from the multiplicity of uses he has found for Watts. Not just to sell, not just to service, but to get closer to customers, even using Watts for qualifying prospects. I am proud to present our Salesman of the Year, Wendell Metcalf. Metcalf? Metcalf? Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Watts, well, it's another way to get things done today. I That's fine. I'm I will sure try to live. Another big night of high school basketball action in Missouri. Class 1A and 2A winners are now just one step away from the state semifinal matchups. And at the Class 1A sectional in Poplar Bluff tonight, the Scott Central boys and the Risco girls both came out winners. Let's check some of the highlights from Poplar Bluff. For the boys tonight, Scott Central beat Eminent 66-49. to You'll see Scott Central's number 33, Tom Estes, for two points right there. He is a junior. And for Eminence, well, Jeff Williams had a good night. The junior will hit for two points right here in the dark jersey from the outside. But Scott Central had too much offense. Eddie Foster, number five, will uh, pop for two right here. It goes in. The crowd enjoys those kind of shots. Scott Central beat Eminence in the girls' game. The Risco girls also won tonight. This is Mary Buck for Risco in the white. Watch this steal. Mary Buck will go in for an easy layup. Risco beat Couch. 58 to 39. So the Scott Central boys and the Risco girls advance to the Class 1A quarterfinals. It was 2A sectional action at Sykeston High School this evening, and the Haytai boys and the Portageville girls were winners. Mark Johnson was there and has this report. Bill and Dark have little trouble with Elsinore. Number five, Marianne Drake, and number 20, Cynthia Mitchell. The guards both had 23 points to lead the attack as the Lady Bulldogs advanced to the state quarterfinals with an 82 to 60 win. In boys' action, it was Kelly in the dark against a fast, running high, jumping Haytai. 20 and six on the season. Haytai played a tough inside early to set the tempo. Kelly kept things close on a usual hot shooting night from Kendall Ayers. But it was Haytai taking the ball to the glass and winning 87 to 79. They also advanced to the state quarterfinals Wednesday night in Flat River. Mark Johnson for KFES 12 Sports. And let's check the high school school board for tonight. That Class A sectional at Popper Bluff. You heard Mark say Scott Central boys over Eminence. The girls, the Risto girls over Couch. Actually, you heard Mark reporting from Sykeston in the Class 2A sectional. It was Haytai, a winner over Kelly. 87-79 boys play. The Portageville girls beat Elsinore. Class 3A at Dexter now. District action. Boys, Charleston, an easy winner over Twin Rivers. New Madrid, a loser to East Prairie. East Prairie beat New Madrid by two. Kennett over Carruthersville. And it was Malden, a winner over Dexter 56-50. Class 3A at Fredericktown, all girls games. Perryville over Fredericktown. Jackson, a winner over Farmington. Flat River beat Arcadia Valley. And North County leads Potosi at halftime, the last score we had. Carbondale Regional, Murfreesboro, a winner over Marion, 68-61. We have some highlights from that game tonight for Murfreesboro. You'll see it coming up in the white jerseys. This is Travis Kellum, number 10, going up for two right there. He is a junior for Murfreesboro. And also Jerry Baker, number double zero, will get this ball ahead on a fast break and double zero will put it in. A two-handed layup right there for Jerry Bankhead. He's a senior. The Marion team played it very tough. Scott Robinson, a 6'1 senior, will go up for two. And also another senior, Barry Johns, will go up for two right here. Now Murfreesboro, however, won the game, beating Marion 68 to 61. Some college action tonight also. In one of the games, the Murray State Racers took on third-ranked Louisville. Well, Louisville won the ball game. Let's check the scoreboard. Third-ranked Louisville over Murray State, 66-58. Glenn Green led Murray with 19 points. Memphis State, a winner over Cincinnati. University of Tennessee Chattanooga defeated Tennessee Temple. And in women's action, UT Martin over Arkansas State, 89-80. to Speaking of college, the Associated Press top 20 poll out for this week. Houston Cougars are number one for the first time since 1968. Virginia number two, followed by Louisville, Villanova, Arkansas, UCLA is sixth, Kentucky seventh, followed by North Carolina, Nevada, Las Vegas, falls from first to ninth, St. John's is tenth, Missouri is thirteenth in this week's poll. Saturday afternoon, the Southeast Missouri State Indians won their second straight MIAA conference title. Well, today, the MIAA all-conference team was selected, and for the second straight year, Seymour has the league's most valuable player. Terry Mead, who averaged around 14 and a half points a contest, is the MIAA most valuable player. Teammate Jewel Crawford also made the all-conference first team, along with Curtis Gibson of Rolla, Victor Coleman of Northwest Missouri, Ron Nunley of Central Missouri, and for the second straight year, Ron Shoemate, the MIAA coach of the year, and for good reason. Two years, Shoemate's teams have won 42 and have lost 15, and that's a look at sports, Mike. Uh, Postseason awards come in now. Tournament this week. Okay, Murray State played them tough at Louisville tonight. Uh, they sure did, but lost. Uh, well, 
But it looks impressive anyway. A, a lot of people lose to Louisville. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Thank you, Randy. Dave? Well, little Terry Kimes is still undergoing surgery at this hour. At 1 o'clock this afternoon, Terry was taken to an operating room at the University of Minnesota Medical Center to close the ureters in his back and connect the ureter tubes to his bladder. Terry was expected to be out of surgery by 8 o'clock tonight, but Terry's mother has informed Channel 12 the extended hours for the surgery are to remove the baby's own kidney in preparation for a kidney transplant in the future. The baby's one remaining kidney will have to be functioning or Terry will be put on dialysis. Again, there is nothing definite until Terry is out of surgery and uh, he is still undergoing surgery at this hour. We'll keep you posted as to his condition. But the way it stands right now, everything is, is going well. Apparently, that's, that's the word. We'll know more by tomorrow, hopefully. That's our report. Early news on The Breakfast Show with Jim Burns and Bob Reeves. Good night. Good night.